I am very, very, very pleased now to have a close friend, compatriot and colleague of Ron Placone, who appeared on the original vigil stream with us back on March 28th with us now. His name is Graham Elwood. Graham, like Ron Placone and like Jimmy Dore, who I'm sure that you are all very familiar with, is a progressive comedian, YouTube show host, and probably a pretty familiar face to you guys. Hi, Graham. How are you today? Uh, I'm good, Susie. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to a bit of light comedy. We've been getting into the like deep historical stuff. <laughs> um, so your contribution will be really welcome. I just want to say thank you so much for agreeing to participate and to speak and to advocate for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. No, I appreciate you guys inviting me in that and and thank you so much for putting this uh, together. It's a cool thing and uh, it's it's amazing to me uh, that more people aren't um, up in arms. It sort of shows you the uh, the reach of the corporate media that they're able to get people to, to, to not um, pay attention to this. And so I I. I uh, really applaud this because if they can do it to him, they could do it to anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, this event that we are running is spectacular for a number of reasons, if I do say so myself. Firstly, because we have over, tw I think, 25 guests appearing consecutively on the stream for an hour each, which I think has got to be some kind of record, definitely in terms of advocating for Julian and WikiLeaks in a live format. I think the original vigil, we had maybe 13 or 14 people and it lasted 10 hours. This time we have 25 people for 25 hours, so it's quite an undertaking. Um, <laughs> but it's also, it's also really significant, Graham, because we have brought voices together from across the entire political spectrum. We have libertarians, we have progressives, we have people who voted for Hillary, we have people who voted for Trump, we have you know traditional conservatives, we have absolutely everybody. People that would usually never appear together at an event, never even maybe talk to each other, interact with each other. And so it's really powerful. And to yet again have someone like yourself who bring you, you're a completely different political perspective to uh, Dima, who we just had on, and to many of our other guests. You know, we had Jack Pasayabek earlier, who to think would be on the same stream as many of the other progressives we've had is just absolutely incredible. But we're here for the single focus of advocating for press freedom, human rights, the restoration and the protection of human rights of Julian Assange and of WikiLeaks. So I would really like you to give us a bit of background about yourself, give us some plugs for where people can find your work and to let us know what it is in particular about Julian and WikiLeaks that you find significant. Um, well, yeah, so my name is Graham Elwood. I've been a stand-up comic for, for many years, and I started doing my YouTube show about a year and a half ago called The Political Vigilante. I've been a longtime friend of Jimmy Dore and was on his show maybe a month or so after the 2016 election and saw what I had seen Jimmy in several years and saw what he had built up with his YouTube channel, and I, and I started talking about how... Um, you know, I voted for Obama twice and then I lost my home uh, due to his uh, bailing out the banks and letting them basically do whatever they wanted. And, and I was really mad about that, but I didn't speak about it publicly. And Jimmy said to me, Graham, you should start a YouTube channel because people are hungry for a guy like you because you have this really awful story. And um, so I, I, I started doing that. I started. Um, doing the show and wanting to get at the truth. And uh, I'm, I've always been a huge Batman fan. This is a Japanese Batman shirt that I'm wearing. And um, that's why I came up with the name Political Vigilante because I just was realizing that, you know, I can't really tr trust the media. I can't really trust either parties. And people need to wake up to this fact because America has been very deliberately divided into all of these teams. You're a red state, blue state, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, black, white, male, female, whatever, to keep us divided so that we don't realize the reality, which is the one percenters are, are basically uh, <laughs> stacking everything against us. So 
Um, I started doing my YouTube show. Um, if you go to youtube.com slash Graham Elwood, you can watch my show. I do 12 videos a week. I do a, a live chat every week. Um, and I'm also a touring comedian. Uh, Ron Placone and I are going to do our progressive comedy tour June 20th through the 24th. We're going to Nashville, Huntsville, Alabama, Asheville, North Carolina, Louisville, Kentucky, and Atlanta. So if you go to GrahamElwood.com, you can get everything. If you go to my website, you can follow me on social media. And, uh, you know, what Julian has shown to me is the sort of hypocrisy of the two-party system in America. Because, you know, when he was doing stuff when he was revealing stuff about George Bush, everybody on the left in America loved him and the right didn't like him. And then when he started revealing stuff about Obama and the Clintons, then ever and then all of a sudden everybody didn't didn't like him. And I think uh, on the left. And so you know the the two party system in America is like a shit sandwich and the Republican shit sandwich has, uh, you know, cheese and bacon on it. And the Democrat shit sandwich has, um, you know, a gluten-free bun that's organic. Uh, and they expect us to eat these. And what that's what Julian Assange, for me, has shown. He's shown that absolute power corrupts absolutely. He's shown that um, the, the, those that are in power abuse their power. And the fact that then he has basically been a political prisoner. He's not allowed to leave the, Equ you know, the, the Ecuadorian embassy. And even when he was accused of sexual assault, I remember thinking, well, if he did the, you know, he needs to stand trial. And if this happened, you know, he needs to be held accountable for this. And he said, you know, I'll go on trial. You just can't, um, you know, extradite me to the United States, which they wouldn't agree to do. And then some of the women even dropped the charges. And I was like, man, this just doesn't seem right how he's being treated and why it's important for any of us. Like, so I, I do independent media on YouTube, right? And I've had my, anytime I do a video about Yemen, Syria, um, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, it gets demonetized. So the corporate state doesn't want any of us talking about this. And all Julian Assange has done, people give him information and he publishes it. He's putting the truth out there. He's making transparency and we live in, in crazy times. So much so, like you say, that people from all these different political backgrounds and ideology, ideologies are coming together to back this dude because it's not right. You might... And, and I think the, the, we need to get out of the team thing, you know, like, oh, I voted for this candidate or that candidate, so I'm not going to be as critical of them when I think, in fact, it should be the opposite. If I voted for someone, I should be more critical of them. And so I see what Julian Assange has done and what he's gone through, and now he's being, you know, basically he's showing the symptoms of somebody that's been in solitary confinement, because he is. and. If they can do it to him, they can do it to any of us. And we're supposed to, you know, in America and all of the other Western uh, countries, we're supposed to have freedom of speech. We're supposed to be able to do this. And the media, the news used to be the watchdogs of those in power. That was their job, was to be the watchdogs, to go, wait a minute, that's not right. You can't do that. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this war? Why is this politician getting money from this organization? And now the news is bought and paid for. I saw an ad on CNN yesterday for the American Petroleum Institute. So that's what they're in favor of. That's who they're for. And I think that, you know, all of these, everyone getting together from all these different things shows you how crazy it is right now. I mean, like when, when, you know, Tucker Carlson is calling out the rocket attacks in Syria. I mean, he's the only one in the mainstream media that was saying this isn't right. I was like, we are living in insane times, but maybe the insane times that we're in are going to be the thing they're going to motivate people to get more involved because they have, you know, they have designed a system that is for apathy. They want us not involved in America 
That's why our elections are on a Tuesday. It's a 13 hour window. There's all these Byzantine laws from state to state about how to register and when, and all this other stuff. And some states have progressive laws like California that have vote by mail, but even then they can, they can play with. So they want us not paying attention. They want us constantly distracted by this politician said this or the, you know, this tweet or Stormy Daniels or whatever, because what, when you start paying attention, you realize that it's those that are in power are running everything. And the American political system, the two party system is like professional wrestling. And it's, you know, it's like, and everyone's, you know, argue, oh, well, Fox News is bad, and but it's MSNBC. And it's just like, well, Sean Hannity is just the conservative wrestling character, and Rachel Maddow is the liberal wrestling character, and they both serve the same corporate benefactors. So I want to see, I actually, stuff like this gets me inspired because it means more people are waking up and they're, they're abandoning their, their teams, you know, and their partisanship to realize this isn't right. Because I tell you what, I don't agree with most of what Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity have ever said, but if they think they're immune to getting locked up for something they said, they're wrong. They could get locked up. Rachel Maddow, anyone, anyone, any journalist could get locked up now. That's what this proves. And, could, and look at how what they're doing. The way that they're doing it and how they're accusing him and he, who's accusing them. So, like, it's inspirational to me what Julian is, has put himself through all for the truth. He's sacrificed his, his family life, his personal life, all for the truth. He's done that. He's made that choice. And so I feel like if he's willing to do that, that's a big ask. The least we can do is come forward and support him and say, this isn't right. Absolutely. Okay. There's a lot for us to unpack there, Graham. I'm <laughs> There is a lot, um, but you're speaking my language in a really, really big way. Uh, so I'm going to try and take that in consecutive order. So the first thing that you mentioned is that the, the paradigm of the 1% versus the 99% is very much still in effect and undeniably so. So the Occupy movement, we're told is dead and has gone. Personally, I think it has spawned into hundreds of other initiatives around the world that without Occupy would probably not have ever come into existence. But the key core message of, that sparked Occupy is still what we are all forced to live with at the moment, which is the massive global income inequality, the sucking up of the wealth of billions by a few thousand people, uh, you know, at most, actually. Um, this is still like the struggle that we have. Person. And go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, to be clear, it's like 30 some families have as much wealth as the bottom half of the entire planet. Just Which is completely unsustainable. Yes. It is epically unsustainable. It's epically and, 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 and it has been it has been sustained by this division that you've been talking about. Yeah. And I just want to say this real quick. Um, if they, they the, the, these top 30 some families, if they were to give up half of their wealth they would improve the lives of billions of people and they wouldn't lose a thing. They wouldn't lose one of their private jets or any, they would have the same opulent life that they're leading right now. And I just want people to understand how egregious the inequities are and how selfish and, and greedy the 1% are. So there, I'm sorry. I, I, I completely agree with you there. Um, I was, I campaigned for Occupy for a, a long period of time and that, was the beginning that was what sparked my journey into becoming an, an activist and uh, independent media figure as well. Um, okay, so the division that you're talking about has been a tool of the powers that be, and Julian has been very clear. Actually, some tweets, um, past tweets of his were just reshared by the at Unity4j account on Twitter, where Julian is basically saying, uh, to boil it down, this is a class war. It's, it's, not, it's not about the politics. This is a class war. Without a doubt. I mean, that's, and I, I think it's, it's, it's good that we're cutting right to it and getting, it, this is, we're, pe they're trying to make everything more complicated. 
by and, and not showing just the simplicity of what this is. It's class warfare. You, you can, and, and anytime someone says, well, this party, this, and this politician, that, I, I, it's class warfare. It's class warfare. When you start looking at the Trumps and the Clintons and the Bushes and the Obamas are all very, what separates them? Very little. You know, they're the wealthiest people and the most powerful people in the world. And they do business with all these multinational conglomerates that control everything. So that's what this is. It is class warfare without a shadow of a doubt. When Jeff Bezos, who's the richest man in the, who that's ever lived, has employees that have to get food stamps. They're, they have a full-time salary and they still have to get food stamps and he doesn't care. It just shows you what this class warfare really is. So that brings another, um, another angle on WikiLeaks releases because WikiLeaks releases have not just been targeted at governments. They've also been targeted at corporations, corporations who have committed egregious crimes against humanity, really. So I'm thinking like Bhopal, India and instances like that, you know, mass poisonings of, of land, the environment and, and people. So in what ways, uh, I'd be particularly interested to know actually, what WikiLeaks releases have really, I mean, everybody knows, you know, 2016 election, whatever, that's been done to death. But I'm really interested to know, like, when did you become aware of WikiLeaks? Like, have you seen collateral murder? Were you across the Iraq war logs and Afghanistan logs? It was, it was then I, because I, as a stand-up comic, I started in 2004, I went to do my first comedy tour for the, for the military and coalition forces in Afghanistan. So I've been to Afghanistan in 04, 06, 07, and I was in Iraq 07, 08, and 2011. And I was in Kuwait um, during all those Iraq trips and also a standalone tour in 2012. So it really... It was when the stuff was getting released about Iraq and Afghanistan because it had a really personal effect on me. I went there and I even did a movie about it called Afghanistan, which is available um, on Amazon Prime of all places. <laughs> um, uh, but you can also get it uh, through my website. Um, and what happened to me over there was I was so, so conflicted. And you want to talk about, I really kind of, for the first time, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back was seeing the class warfare in that, you know, I had such an affinity for the military, the soldiers, because, you know, we have an all voluntary, an all volunteer military, right? And I went over there and I would see these these, many of these men and women wanting to do the right thing there for, for noble reasons. And then I saw, you know, Halliburton, you know, the, the privatization of the military. And I was like, this is wrong. So when, so when Julian Assange started releasing stuff about those wars, I was like, man, I'm glad he's doing this. Someone needs to hold them accountable because I would just, I would be standing in the middle and be, I was so conflicted. I was so conflicted because, you know, you're, I, I talked, I talked to people in the military. Like, yeah, we're, 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 we're trying to do good things. And we've provided, you know, we provided security for a girl's school in Afghanistan. These girls, because the Taliban was shooting rockets at girls schools. And I was like, Oh my God, I have three nieces. None of them have ever had to worry about rockets. They have to worry about people coming in their schools with guns, but they don't have to worry about, people shooting rockets at their school. They don't have landmines near their, their nice suburban schools in America. There's no landmines in America. And Afghanistan is the most heavily mined country in the world. So it was so, it affected me on such a personal level that when he started releasing stuff, I was like, good. Because I saw it. I saw the inequities. I saw the, the class warfare. I saw the, like, our, our, I don't like these terrorists, but then I would hear stories from soldiers and Marines and interrogators saying, well, well, here's how it works. Here's how an IED, an improvised explosive device, gets put together. Um, they find some poor farmer because opium is the only crop. And then at, at, at a certain point, we were like, oh, we got to get rid of the opium because of the war on drugs. So now some poor farmer that lives in a village, I'm sure he's Muslim, but he's not a radical Muslim, who's just trying to feed his family, Al-Qaeda comes to him or the Taliban and says, look, I'll give you $100 to just put this 
this this thing by the side of the road. And then they find another guy and go, hey, I'll pay you $100 to just make this phone call when you see the American convoy go by. Okay. Are they jihadists? Or they just need $100 to feed their family? And this is the class warfare we're talking. I was really seeing it. I was like, why aren't we helping rebuild this country? And, and, and also, I had to look at the lineage of America. I'm like, the Taliban basically was the Mujahideen that we armed against the war with the Soviets. The reason Afghanistan is the most heavily mined country in the world is because of that war. And, you know, I remember feeding kids that ran across the, ran along the side of a minefield. And there's like a downed Russian MIG and I'm feeding them water and like granola bars through razor wire. And I'm like, this isn't right. We're tr and, and, and I saw the big war machines, how they profited and how, you know, job, like the, the, like the, the, the mess hall, which used to be jobs that were done by military folks were now being contracted out to the Halliburton folks who were making Instead of 30 grand a year, they're making 80, 90, $120,000 a year. And the taxpayer is paying for this. And trillions of dollars were being spent. And I'm like, God, this could be fixing so many things in America. We could be actually just coming here and rebuilding. Instead of bombing, we could be rebuilding the Middle East. I mean, this, I saw it. So when he first started, when WikiLeaks first started dropping stuff during that time, I was... It affected me personally because I had been there, seen it, smelled it, tasted it, cried over it, and was like, the, we need to get the truth out there. Because, and, and I saw how people in America just wanted this, they wanted to apply conservative American logic or liberal American logic to a situation that you can't apply American logic. You know, they just, Americans are so, you grew up in the West. You, don't, you have no concept what a war-torn third world country is. So it's just like, it was, it was a profound effect on me. And that's when I first started going, well, I'm glad, he's, I'm glad he's opening this stuff up. And I'm glad he and then people like Glenn Greenwald are out there saying stuff. Absolutely. And yet again, now there's so much to unpack from that. First of all, how incredible that you were actually in Afghanistan, that you've actually seen these things with your own eyes. That is, there are not many people that, um, that can say that. Um, and the way it really touched me, how you said you were personally impacted, personally affected by the um, significance of WikiLeaks releases. And the story that you were just telling too about the, you know, the guy trying to feed his family needs a hundred dollars just reminds me so much of your men. Your men, people are selling or giving up their children to be able to feed their other children. They're having to give away one child so that they can keep three or two. And that to me is just, I mean, as a parent, that it's stunning stunning that we can allow and facilitate such things to go on and who is perpetrating that saudi arabia and who are they you know they're being yet again armed and funded by the us the uk and some european states as well um and are they going to be the next taliban you know in, in 15 20 years time is it going to be saudi terrorists that we armed and funded that we're now having to deal with is like this recurring cycle throughout the generations yeah it's it's I'll give you the hundred and what is it? 120 or 130 kids die every day in Yemen. That just, I, I, I can't even, I don't have kids of my own, but I have six nieces and nephews. So I'll, I'll tell you another, you talk about the inequities of this world, the class warfare that is literally in certain areas like Yemen is actual warfare against the poor. We are bombing and killing and creating humanitarian crises with the poorest country on the face of the earth. I'll give you an example in Afghanistan that I was told about. So if a goat wanders into a minefield in Afghanistan, a goat is a very valuable thing. Goat's milk, it feeds your family. You can sell that milk. You can take some of that milk and make products to sell it with. It is, it is one of the more valuable things an Afghani farmer can have. If a goat wanders into a minefield, the dad can't go get the goat in the minefield because if he dies, there's the, 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 
the head of the household. So he has to send one of his middle children, not the oldest child, because if he dies, oh then the oldest child. So the dad has oh to say, hey, child, you got to go into that minefield and get that goat and don't blow up. This is a decision that has oh. to, if this is not the most disgusting uh, 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 example of the failure of capitalism that has created this, it, I, 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 I don't know what else to tell you. I'd like to ask anyone, anyone that's a parent, say, well, do you want to make that decision? You know, so uh, the, the fact that Julian Assange is, is pointing this stuff out, we in the West have to wake up to this and hold all of our governments accountable, all of them. And then think about what it is that makes, you know, this okay or, or palatable or easier to be distracted from. Um, for most citizens of the West, and that is the same type of otherization, division that we see in the political sphere as well. It's the, oh, well, they're not my people. Oh, well, they don't look like me or they don't think like me or they believe different things to me. Makes it so much more easy to dehumanize them, to deprioritize them. Um, and particularly in the case of the drone, and I don't want to get too far off the topic of WikiLeaks and Julian here, but um, having studied, you know, the Snowden files and uh, spoken with drone, interviewed drone whistleblowers, um, what is occurring is spiraling from one country to the next, to the next, to the next. And I firmly believe, I mean, we're already seeing uh, drone, military drone usage on the US borders, you know, eventually that will become weaponized, eventually that will be on home turf. And there's just no way that, call it karma, call it whatever you want, but eventually we're going to get a dose of our own medicine. I don't, I don't want to see America collapse. I don't want to see a, a civil war or unrest, but I'm trying to get my head around how it's going to be avoided because we're, Obama didn't re regulate anything with the banks. He didn't prosecute anybody. So we are facing another, um, we're facing another financial crisis is going to happen. I don't want it to happen, but people way smarter than me keep saying, oh, it's happening. It's it, everything that was happening in 07 is happening now again. And so when that happens and you have 50 to 100 million people out of work because America has, you know, 60 some percent of its population doesn't have a thousand dollars in savings. And while everyone's like, oh, the unemployment rates are really low. It's because everybody's working two and three jobs and barely getting by. When you have tens of millions of people out of work and they start protesting and striking, you better believe that this militarized police that we have is going to turn on its own citizens. And it's terrifying to think about. And what you say, the drone strikes on the home turf are going to happen. So all of these people who've been like, well, drone strikes, not my problem. And hey, those terrorists, they brought it on themselves. And it's like, we have to wake up to that fact. We have to wake up to, uh, that was one of the things that woke me up again about, uh, about Obama was, as Cornell West says, was just the first black leader of the American empire, you know? And if people don't want to, I, I don't understand how people can chastise Julian Assange for just putting out information that somebody gave him. He's not creating, he didn't, he didn't mock this up. He didn't, you know, he didn't, he's not concocting his people. Like if I give you or you give me information about people committing crimes and I put it online, how am I the bad guy? I don't get it. So. You are the bad guy because you are supposed to be a good product of your social conditioning, which has been engineered for decades to ensure that you do not ever participate in such, you know, activity, asserting independence um, or really becoming even a real journalist. You're supposed to aspire to money and, you know, wealth and possessions, materialism and having a wife, you know, a, what do they say, a Stepford wife. And then that is supposed to be the sum total of happiness. But funnily enough, the people who have all three of those things don't end up very happy at all because it's actually not a fulfilling existence. Whereas people like Julian, and I had a wonderful conversation at the beginning of this vigil with John Kiriakou, and we discussed this very fact. We discussed the um, this dichotomy where you have 
these CIA executives, intelligence agency executives, and they go to work in their expensive suit and they're so they're omnipotent, they're powerful, they have access to these billions of dollars of resources, they uh, um, they are able to feel drunk on the personal power vested in them by the state office, by this office of the empire. But then they go home at night and they they know there's that niggling little thought inside them. They know that actually they don't have any personal power because the only power that they experience is that that is given to them by their compliance with this office, with the state and with the government. And they, they know that if they were to whistleblow or they were to turn against that, that they would lose all of those trappings of power. But those like John Kiriakou who have made that choice and who have chosen ethics and morality and the public right to know, they live the opposite life. They don't have any of the financial trappings. They have none of the trappings of power. They don't have an office or any power vested in them. But when they go home at night, they have the satisfaction of looking in the mirror. They know that they made the right choices. They're at peace with their conscience. Um, and so this, do you see what I mean? It's, it's yeah. like almost the opposite thing. And then we discussed how WikiLeaks has become, WikiLeaks was called a hostile state intelligence service by Pompeo, but actually what WikiLeaks does is the opposite of an intelligence service because an intelligence service uses lies, misinformation, manipulations, blackmail, torture, murder, you know, naked violence and and um, exertions of power and influence whereas wikileaks is the total opposite wikileaks doesn't use any of those tactics wikileaks uses truth truth is the means to wikileaks end whereas lies are the means to the ends of the intelligence agency so in that sense we see wikileaks as almost an inoculating force against these um the agencies of the state I love that term, the inoculating force. I love that they're inoculating this virus of the CIA and their lies and deception. That's fantastic. Um, uh, you know, the CIA uh, is, they have no bounds. I mean, they are putting, there's ex-CIA, well, I put X in quotes, CIA operatives running as Democrats in the primaries in many in many races here in the US because they're you know yay resistance which just shows you the whole theater of Trump and this fake resistance and and uh I, I want to go back to to the the moral question that you you brought up about these these powerful people not just the CIA but these corporate people that have to just make billions and billions of dollars and amass all of these private planes and all of these material things, what do they think is going to happen when they die? I mean, I don't know what their belief system is. Many mm -hmm. of them call themselves Christians. I'm just like, well, you might want to read the actual Bible then that says it's easier for the camel to get through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. So um, I don't know. I, you know, I don't want to go to jail or ha have my comforts taken away from me, but we're all going to die and I'm going to die with a clean conscience because I didn't profit off the backs of, <laughs> of poor people. I mean, I didn't cause human misery. I made people laugh, hopefully, and I hopefully made them think. And um, I mean, it's, it's mystifying to me I always want to ask these people, like, do you see your reflection in the mirror? Like, because uh, most vampires can't see themselves because they don't have souls. So I don't know how you're able to operate <laughs> as a human if you, every morning you get up and then you lie to yourself that, like, oh, I'm doing this for national security. No, you're not. You're doing this for the defense contractors and ExxonMobil and Goldman Sachs, and that's who you're working for. You're not protecting liberty. Absolutely true. Um, Elizabeth Lee Voss from Disobedient Media and myself um, for several months now, maybe more like six, seven, eight months, have been studying Snowden documents live online, actually um, putting the documents up on the screen, reading through them with a, a group of crowdsource OS Int uh, people who scour through them with us. And inside those documents, I can tell you is the story that the mainstream media has not told about the Snowden documents. We've heard about the breaches of privacy. We've heard about mass surveillance. And those are both extremely important topics that did need to be discussed and, and that everybody should be aware of. But buried within the rest of those documents is 
the full story. And the full story is the NSA admitting that the military is deploying to secure an unimpeded flow of oil from West Africa. Uh, the NSA admitting that they supplied George W. Bush and Colin Powell with the intelligence, the so-called intelligence uh, that they used at the UN to advocate for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the NSA admitting that they are spying for economic gain. The NSA admitting that one of their customers is the Federal Reserve Bank, which is not even a department of the government. Um, so the Federal Reserve Bank, when they want to know something about anybody on the planet, can put a customer needs information request to the NSA and access the uh, data from the mass surveillance. Um, that's just a few examples. I could go on and on and on. There's been hundreds of findings. But what these agencies are up to is not at all, funnily enough, what they say that they're up to. And absolutely none of it could be morally defended at any level. It is, in fact, a grotesque vacuuming up of the resources of the planet, and we know where that is being funneled to, and it's certainly not the American people. Oh, no, no, it's, there's no, I mean, first of all, I think it's it, what, what you and, and uh, Elizabeth Boss are doing with Disobedient Media, man, that, that's, that website is, <laughs> I always tell her, I go, your, your articles and your research are so thorough it is impressive. And the fact that the two of you have been going through all the Snowden stuff is amazing to me. And, and, and what, what has happened in this like last year and a half of, of doing more investigating, it actually becomes very simple. It's like, if this country has natural resources and they won't play ball with the US, oh, they're terrorists, there's a terrorist state. You know, uh, the minute Iran said, we're going to go off the dollar for the euro, I was like, well, I bet you they got weapons of mass destruction. And sure enough, a day later, Netanyahu's with his charts and graphs saying, oh, look at all these bomby, bomby, bombersons that they're making over there. And it's just like, it's almost, I mean, it's horrifying, but it's, it is comical that it is so predictable now. Once you understand that it's all about the petrodollar, it's all about furthering uh, American corporate interests and oil, it, you, 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 it all makes sense. Anybody threatens that, boom, they get taken out. They either buy you or they, they jail you. That's what they do. And somebody changes their tune, you know, somebody like Howard Dean or John Kerry, yeah, yeah, and then all of a sudden now they're like these war, gay war people. Well, they've been bought out. Somebody bought them. I mean, and... First of all, big shout out to the NSA for watching this right now. Hey, fellas, thanks. For <laughs> um, they're my biggest. They're my biggest fans. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> hey, why don't you buy one of my T-shirts, uh, NSA? It's go to grandmelwood.com. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you whistle blow NSA? Why do, Why don't you be one of the people who doesn't have the wealth and power by day, but has the the sound conscience by night and can actually sleep at night knowing that you've made the right contribution. That's what I would say to them. Yeah. Um, bringing, this, bringing this back to Julian and WikiLeaks. So you can type, you know, the name of any country in the world into wikileaks.org search engine and learn everything that your school, your university and the mainstream media never, ever, ever taught you about that country. Um, it's been a very interesting for me to see this, I almost want to say like this revolution, this, this comedy revolution that's been occurring across like Lee Camp, yourself, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, the list goes on and on and on. I'm wondering if you can give me some perspective about how did that happen? How have we now got comedians that can clock half a million YouTube views when a CNN video gets 30,000? Uh, like <laughs> where, where, where did this come from? Well, I think it came from several things. First of all, people are really hungry for the truth. They know they're getting lied to. And I think that hit a, you know, that culminated with the, the scam of the, of the Democratic primary in 2016. I think everybody was just like, wait, what? And, um, you know, I think Jimmy and Lee, like, Jimmy started doing this political stuff a while ago and he took a lot of crap when he started being very critical of Obama. And what's happened since the election is uh, sadly, there's just a lot, most of the comedians here, at least in Los Angeles and even New York and around the country, they're neoliberals. And so all we're hearing is just Trump jokes. That's all they've got is Trump jokes. And it's just like, 
okay, yeah, yeah, crazy haircut. He said shithole countries, but they won't, they refuse to look at the system and they're, so what is- And what so is, these are the, sorry to interrupt you, but these are the comedians that, uh, you know, have the big gigs on the big major cable networks, right? They're earning how many million dollars a year, you know, to do their shows, but then they're watering them down to only what is- appropriate content you know whereas you have someone like jimmy who's no holds bars you know gutter mouth but like or potty mouth but but people love him they can't get enough of him because he's not bullshitting because here's the thing you watch you know and i've even you know john oliver did you know he did a really episode a couple years ago about the drone thing and he did some decent episodes but then he went after jill stein because the clintons are friends with the guy that runs time warner and it's just like you just can't you see the connections to the bullshit and you see like, you know, Seth Meyers and, and, uh, and all the late night hosts, you know, they're on the big corporate media. And when there's an ad for some pharmaceutical company or, you know, the oil lobby or the war machine between their Trump jokes, you, you just go, this is, this is bullshit. And, and I think too many people went, Hey, wait a minute. The super delegates, like, hey, wait a minute, this ain't right. You can't just sit there and tell me this party's bad, but this party's better. And so when you've got somebody like Jimmy Dore calling everybody out on it, and the thing that's that's great is when you're on YouTube and you make your own money and you have a Patreon page, there's nobody, there's nobody telling you. They know no one's telling Jimmy to say that. There's nobody, there's no producer in his ear going, oh, you can't say that. Or let's just talk about this instead. Those little subtle forms of censorship that you happen. That's why Rachel Maddow was not talking about Flint, Michigan. She's not talking about Yemen. All she's talking about is Russia because Russia, demonizing Russia, it gets us right back into another Cold War to justify, you know, Trump is saying these crazy things that Reagan said in the 80s about like, Oh, we need to build our defense back up. Really? We outspend the next seven countries combined. And we need more military budget. So people are hearing Lee Camp. They're hearing Jimmy Dore and, and even to lesser degrees, myself and Ron Placone and, and other comics because they're starved for us. I say this on my show all the time. I say, you might not agree with me and I might get it wrong, but I'll tell you this. I, if I get it wrong, I got it wrong because I made a mistake and I'll say, I'll come on the show and say, I got that wrong. I'm not getting it wrong or saying something because some producer or some corporation is in my ear. No, that won't happen. And I was fired from a, from a job last summer uh, for a movie review show because I'm also have a movie review podcast uh, called Comedy Filmers. They hired me to do this gig and they fired me for my Twitter feed. <laughs> how how Roseanne? <laughs> I, know. I know the crazy thing was my twitter feed at the time was calling out all of these uh california democrats in the california state senate that that had voted down single-payer health care they're trying to get single-payer health care for the state of california and a bunch of democrats voted it down so my twitter feed was calling them out no swear words, no fuck yous, no all cap, just saying this is nonsense, look what they're doing. I got fired for that. And I did a video like the next day saying, I'm not backing down, I'm not quitting. And people went, all right, I'm in. You know, and that's that's just it. I'm not, no one's, no one's buying me. No one's buying me. And no one's buying Jimmy Dore. No one's buying Lee Camp. Well, actually, your audiences are collectively buying you, and sometimes for just a dollar a piece. And that is proving to be enough to sustain you guys. Um, and your audiences are continually building. And that's the, the trajectory of, like, Jimmy Dore's channel is just absolutely off the charts, whereas the trajectory of CNN is extremely regressive. Well, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and you look at, I mean, other comics like Tim Black, he was a guy that, and he just want, he just started his own, his own YouTube. We all just said, I'm going to just do this. I just started talking into my phone in my apartment with my surfboard behind me. That's got a, that's a red surfboard. And I always say I surf with Putin with that board. And, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. And so like people, and like you say, yeah, the people that pay me are the, are the viewers, you know, just like, the people that funded Bernie Sanders campaign were the people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely right. right. 
he's still the most popular politician out there. So, and all these new politicians like Tulsi Gabbard and stuff that are saying, I'm not taking corporate money, man, I'm all on board with that. And I'm not taking it either. Um, what has it meant? You being close to Jimmy, I'm interested to know, what has it meant to him um, to have WikiLeaks support of his work? Because, I mean, I know Julian's a huge fan of Jimmy's show. WikiLeaks has pretty consistently shared topical episodes of, of Jimmy's work. Uh, the reason I ask is because Elizabeth and I always say that when WikiLeaks shares our work, it's better than winning a Pulitzer Prize. Like, to us, that's, like, the ultimate achievement. We don't need the accolades of corporate journalists but when a truth-telling organization full of people that put their lives on the line to for the public right to know when they recognize our work for us that's like the ultimate it's been really cool to see this um you know jimmy's been my friend a long time and he'll keep like dude julian assange retweeted me or something and wikileaks we treat and i'm like that's awesome and he as he says on a show he goes i'm just a jag off nightclub comedian and he and i joke we even joked on one of the episodes. We were like, I wish I was just telling jokes and going on TV, being, a, being an idiot, you know, instead of having to do, you know, call out the, the news who should be doing this. Not, not me. So to see it happen to Jimmy was really, to really, it was really awesome to, to see what he's done. And like, he's interviewed Jill Stein and Abby Martin and all these activists and like uh, Gail McLaughlin is running for Lieutenant governor in California. and. I agree. It's, it's the coolest thing that happened for me was the interview I did with Elizabeth Lee Voss about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks tweeted out that YouTube video from my little show and it was nuts. And that video has gotten, was one of my most watched videos. And you know, Elizabeth, like, sent me a message on Twitter, like a direct message, like, check this out. I was like, oh, my God, it was just so, like you say, it is it is the greatest um, compliment you can receive because it's coming from a genuine place. It's coming from somebody that's about telling the truth. And they're like, hey, thank you for telling the truth. And it's like the greatest honor you could ever get. I mean, a Pulitzer Prize, you know, whatever. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean maybe i whatever i wouldn't even it's not even in my it's, it's making me think that maybe we need to have um institute some kind of like comedy truth-telling prize because there is a, <laughs> there is a historical context to this right i mean there's the george carlin's like take us through you know i'm a child yeah. of the 80s so take take me back a little bit further and tell me like where where does this like ethos come from of comedy um meeting with political truth i think really to go back even further, if you go back to the 1930s, art was political. When all of the labor movements were starting in the 30s, the theater, the New York theater, were, they were, art and theater was so political. It had to be. And then getting to stand-up comedy in the 60s, you had Lenny Bruce, who really was like one of the more groundbreaking comedians out there. And then came from him was George Carlin. You had Dick Gregory. Um, and Richard Pryor. And these comics were like calling out um, social issues in comedic ways. They were calling out um, the, the powerful. And I mean, as a young kid, I remember watching their, the first season of Saturday Night Live with Dan Aykroyd and Belushi and all them. And they would do all these sketches and many of them were highly, highly political. And and then as I got older and, and I was in high school and we got a membership to this uh, video rental place and I started watching Le who Lenny Bruce was. And, and so comedy to me has, should always be about social commentary. First and foremost, it needs to be funny, obviously, but comedy, stand-up comedy should be confrontational. Not so much so that the audience is angry at you, but like it should be confrontational. And I remember one of the people I looked up to the most was Bill Hicks. And I saw him perform. Jimmy and I both saw him perform at the Funny Firm in Chicago. Jimmy and I were both young comics and we'd watch Bill Hicks go. And he was calling out the first war in Iraq, the Desert Storm. And he was like, this is bullshit. And he did it in a hilarious manner and he did it in a very in-your-face confrontational manner. So... It's one of the things that comedy is supposed to be that way. And what has happened over the last three decades is this like 
oh, don't make waves. And why are you bringing politics into comedy? And com why are you bringing politics into art? And it's like, wait, what? It's supposed to be that way. And that's why going back to what you said, the handful of like progressive comics like Tim Black and Lee Camp and Jimmy Dore and Ron Placone and we're going out there doing what comedians used to do, which is be confrontational and be political and challenge people's thinkings. The greatest thing you can do is to get someone to laugh. They're going to be more open. If they're laughing, they're going to go, oh man, I hadn't thought of that. Wow, that's a good, oh, that's a good point. Versus an argument, they're just gonna, maybe just going to lock down and dig in and say, you're wrong, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right. And I, know, I saw this, uh, I just directed this show, the First Nations Comedy Experience. It was the first ever Native American stand-up comedy series. It's on FNX, if you go to fnx.org. And it was all these Native American comics. And I was so reinvigorated with stand-up comedy because I've been getting a little disappointed because I'm seeing this comedy of apathy as, as I talked about earlier, they're just making Trump jokes. So their, their whole act is just, Oh, I don't get involved and who cares? And I just play video games and get drunk and high. And these native American comics were like in very funny and smart comedic ways were dispelling all of these misconceptions about native Amer Americans, all these stereotypes about native Americans. And it was like, wow. And I kept saying every show, I'd be sitting in the edit room with the editor going, man, that's a great joke. And wow, then they, that, that comedian or that joke would never be allowed on the corporate TV. They would never be allowed on late night talk shows. And so, and, and one of the pioneers was Charlie Hill. He was the first ever Native American comic on TV. He was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He was on the Richard Pryor show. And he paved the way for all these comics and that's what it should be. And, and Charlie Hill was very political and very funny. And I think it's what comedy should be. It should challenge people. People should leave their thinking. They should walk away and change their perception a little bit and go, wow, about social issues, about politics. And if comedy isn't doing that, and there's nothing wrong with having silly jokes or jokes about dating or whatever. Like I got stuff like that in my act, but like even my act, I had to get a restraining order against an ex and I'm challenging people for that because uh, <laughs> most people don't think uh, attractive young women are capable of being violent and needing a restraining order. So I think everything in comedy should challenge people a little bit and should be a little bit confrontational. And make you kind of laugh and go, oh, wow, but, oh my God, that's crazy. I didn't think of that. Or, oh, that's an awesome point. And then having done the Jimmy Dore shows live, the response from the audience is unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've done shows that I've had standing ovations in front of thousand seat theaters and it's nothing compared to the, the like, yeah, kind of political rally activism and laughing. Graham, what you just, the points that you've just made just totally changed the way that I've been viewing this, uh, the, the comedy phenomenon or, or revolution that I referred to it as being before, because what you just described to me is comedy, comedy is a form of journalism in terms of the ethics, because what are we told about journalism? Journalism should be fierce, it should be adversarial, it should be, um, it should, you know, conflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And what you've just described to me is that you you believe that comedy also should be doing that. And then that just made me think, you know, going back through the centuries, going back to the origins of comedy and theatre and maybe even, you know, the royal court fool or the jester, it, has comedy always been a vehicle to say the things that you couldn't otherwise get away with saying? And I think in Jimmy's case, he's combining that with information because Jimmy will take WikiLeaks tweets, releases, and he will make them topical and make them funny. Am, am I on the right track there? Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. It, it, it is, I mean, some of Shakespeare's comedies were uh, challenging and political. And back then, the only way, you know, if you made the king laugh, you could get away with some stuff. So uh, if you made the royal court laugh, you could get away with some stuff. And I think that's, that's what's going on is like all of us are going, okay, I, I'm going to be informative and funny. And like, I see comedians like making fun of the homeless here in LA. And I'm like, as Jimmy says, don't punch down. You mm. should be asking, why are there so Absolutely. many homeless? 
You should be punching up the powerful. Go after the powerful. You know, George Carlin, I remember watching him say that in the in the 80s. You know, he was being critical of like Andrew Dice Clay, who was making fun of, you know, minorities or whatever. And, and Carlin was like, yeah, I mean, it's funny, I guess. But like, you should make fun of the people in charge. They're the ones that are screwing us over. And Carlin... His fine, you know, his, he was performing in his whatever, his 70s or 80s. And I remember Jimmy's told me he went to one of his shows and he thought it was just going to be a lot of old hippies. And he goes, there were young people. There were people, the, 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 the demographic was all over the map. And that's what I noticed when Ron Placone and I last month did our first leg of the progressive comedy tour. And I remember at one of the shows in Tempe, Arizona. So Arizona's very conservative. It's a lot of, you know, Republicans in that state. And I saw some sort of Arizona Republicans in the audience, probably didn't know who we were, laughing at stuff going, wow, I hadn't thought of that when I was slamming both parties. And then after the show, there was, we had a meet and greet and people were lining up to come talk to us. And there was this like young hippie couple, right? It's who you would expect they voted for Bernie, probably, you know, this like hippie couple, the guy's got dreadlocks, she's got pink hair, you know, and, and then they uh, were like, oh man, we watch you on Jimmy Dore, you're awesome. And I was like, oh, great. Right behind them were three older women, probably in their mid to late sixties, very well dressed, saying the same thing. Oh, we watch you on the Jimmy Dore show. And that's the thing that I have seen at his shows. And now at the shows that Ron Placone and I are doing, and we have shows June 20 through the 24th, go to grandmoa.com, um, is this like it transcends everybody. And that's what the 1% knows. And Julian Assange knows this. That's why he's releasing all this and has been releasing this information. Because the 1% knows that if we all get together, we're unstoppable. That's why they've got to divide us. That's why they've got to put Julian Assange basically uh, in a, as, and he's in jail basically, he can't leave the embassy. And because if we all get together, they want us divided. They want us to say, oh, you're that demographic. You're different than me. You look different than me, you, whatever. If we all got together and say, the 1% is screwing us all over, there's something we could do about it. We can change things overnight. And comedy, I think, is like a laser that shoots through that. Because if I've got you laughing, I've got your ear. You'll listen to me if I've got you laughing. So. That's what I think. And please go to grandmoa.com for the Progressive Comedy Tour, leg two, June 20th through the 24th. It's Ron Placone and I. We're inviting, it's not just Ron and I doing political jokes. We're also inviting progressive organizations, some political candidates. So afterwards, we do a meet and greet. You can talk to people, get information from organizations like Open Primaries and the DSA, and some, there's some candidates we're trying to get out and, that are running for races in, in some, I think, Georgia and one of the other states. So um, get your tickets, go to uh, grandmelwood.com and see what we're doing because there's not a lot of comics doing what we're doing. There's not a lot of comics out, okay. out talking about this in a comedic way and you know, going after the powerful Graham, I think that there's going to be more of them soon because I really think that you guys are setting a trend here and at the end of the day, the numbers speak, you know, or as loud as the words and, and the numbers are absolutely through the roof. I was just wondering, do you think that maybe the comedic approach also is removing some of the fear factor? Because you can't really be scared when you're laughing, right? And I think a lot of people are scared about the state of the world. They are scared about what they see, you know, the, the degradation in their own communities, the economic degradation, the social degradation. I think when they're watching Jimmy Dore, they're able to confront these very serious issues in a way that's not maybe so emotionally devastating as doing it alone. I think that's a great point. And it's one of the things that people, they come out of those shows like invigorate and revive. Because I think when you're just, I've noticed several things, like when you're just home alone reading these news stories or when I'm recording videos, sometimes I'm just like, man, I'll just record like four videos in a row and I'm like, wow, these are all really gnarly. This is all really like pretty negative. But then everyone gets together. I think when you come to the shows, it's like all these people and you look around and you go, oh, I'm not alone. Everyone tells me I'm a crazy progressive. I'm nuts. 
you know, everyone, the Trumpers and the Clinton people tell me I'm crazy. So maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, 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 I'm on the right track and people see these things and go, this is, this is truth. It's what Julian Assange was about. He's all about truth. And you come to these shows and you hear truth and you're laughing and you feel like I feel invigorated. Cause I'm like, well, I'm on the panel and the other comics say stuff that makes me laugh. And I'm like falling out of my chair crying and we're laughing. And it's like, I feel like there's hope. We can make a change here. We can turn this around. We can get more people involved and we can really, you know, um, save this, uh, this runaway train. So it's, so I, that's what I think the comedy does. It gives everybody like, you're laughing. You, you, you physically cannot, you can't be in a bad mood if you're laughing or making a room full of people laugh. They, they say laughter is the best medicine and I've seen it be medicine for activists. Cause you know, activists, particularly like targeted activists, it can get really, really burnt out and really, really down on themselves and, and feel very isolated. One of the main tools of the state is deliberately to target and isolate activists to try to stop them, you know, to try to turn them away from their causes. And I know a group of activists, including some pretty amazing activists, came out to see Lee Camp and Jimmy Dore at Lee Camp's comedy special in L.A., and I actually saw, I can personally testify to the fact that those activists were transformed by the experience. They came away from that. They made friends at the show. They met up with other people they hadn't met before but had spoken to online. They took group photos. They went out afterwards. They had this amazing time. And they came back, like, totally reinvigorated. And it seems that maybe, maybe comedy is a form of medicine a form of medicine for those who are in the struggle. It's, it, it, it is medicine. When you laugh, chemicals in, are released in your body that, I mean, they've done studies. Laughter has literally cured ailments and cured diseases. So like you say, the role of the activist can be pretty brutal sometimes. You can feel pretty beaten and isolated. Like you say, isolated, no matter what I do, I'm never going to, it's never going to change. And the whole system's against me and blah, blah, blah. And then you go to Lee Camp show and there's a line around the block with all these people that think like you. And you're like, Oh yeah. And that's the thing. Like that Lee Camp show, Jimmy Dore show, this progressive comedy tour I'm doing with Ron Placone is about building the community. We talk online, but I'm always like, come to the show live. You guys can meet each other and interact with each other. You all talk online, like when I do my super chats, but now you get to, like you say, group photos and we all go out and everyone's like making each other laugh and going, yeah. And, and then they're changing ideas. Well, I'm involved with this organization. Oh, give me that info. Or I read this book. Oh, let, let me hear that, what that person had to say. Or I'm, what's the name of that candidate you're backing? And that's okay, I'm in. And it's like, it's, then you get charged up. And it happens on a physiological level. It's so fantastic. I'm just sitting here smiling and smiling because I just think, it's, so we need those lights at the end of the tunnel, you know, really, really badly because it's so easy to just get lost in, in the despair and, and feeling like disempowered and like you can't do anything. But I mean, this, when we feed off each other, when we bounce our energy off each other, that those are the beautiful moments. I mean, this stream is a classic example of that. Well, you know, proving that we can bring all these people together and we can find commonalities and we can pursue a shared goal and set aside all the bullshit, set aside the differences and the conflicts and the what, who says about who or thinks about what or tweeted about this or that other thing and just actually really focus on the key thing. And I just got a beautiful image when you were speaking of Julian sitting in the embassy watching Lee, uh, not sorry, watching Jimmy Dore videos that he had then shared. And I just had this image of um, Julian sitting there laughing. And I thought to myself, who would need that comedic relief? Who would need that medicine of the laughter more than Julian in the position that he's in? He's been more isolated than anybody. He's been more targeted than anybody and more smeared than anybody. And the idea that what Jimmy's done and what you guys are doing could have brought relief to even, you know, the world's most famous activist, journalist, and publisher is incredibly special. Yeah. It is incredibly special. That idea just brings, like, warms my heart. And I, 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 I hope he's watched some of Jimmy's videos and laughed. I would love it. And I, I mean, I, if I could, I'd go there and do a show for just him. 
if I could. <laughs> I, bet, I bet he would have loved that too. I bet he would love that. Julian is really into the arts. I know that. And uh, WikiLeaks too is very into the arts and supportive of the arts. And what you guys do is definitely an art form. Um, we are heading into the next guest shortly, but I would just like to ask you, what would you like to see happen with Julian? How do you feel about the future? How do you feel about the US and UK government and what they're doing to him? Um, let's, let's just have you advocate for Julian and WikiLeaks for, for a second, because this really is the primary focus of this movement is to try to, um, to bring people together to advocate for Julian's human rights in, in the way that he has for millions of other people. Yeah, I would tell everybody watching that Julian has fought for you and for me, for all of us, just by putting the truth out there. So it's kind of on us to repay him by petitioning all of our lawmakers, especially if you're in the UK or Ecuador and mainly the US, to say this is not right. And and here in here in America, it's a, we're in a midterm, so you can petition these people that you're potentially going to vote for and say, you better support the freedom of Julian Assange or you're not going to get my vote. And I think the pressure that we all need to put on, they need to know that there is more of us than there are of them. And he needs to be freed. And if you don't think they could come after you or somebody you like and respect, you're wrong. They could. Look what they've done to this man. Just for taking information that was given to him and putting it out there. WikiLeaks is an amazing resource, as you've said, and that was set up by this guy. Other people I know have helped him, but he is in jail, it is wrong, and it's up to all of us to do something about it, to get him free, because they can jail anybody if they want to, and without a free press, which we barely have, mm -hmm. We have no, I mean, there's, uh, there's, bare, there's not much of a democracy. Well, thank you so much for those words and those sentiments. I deeply appreciate you participating in the stream. You've made me smile a lot, Graham. I've okay. pretty much sat here smiling for the last hour and a bit. So thank you very much. I'm sure many of the viewers will have as well. Um, we would love to have you back. We plan on doing these uh, vigils monthly, first weekend of every month, and just making them bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't know if I let this slip before, but we actually have 150 guests shortlisted that we want to invite in the coming months. So I think we are going to try and push this as far as we can and make it as big as we can until we can get some progress on you know, pressuring these governments with a mass movement of people power to let Julian realise his political asylum in Ecuador or to return to Australia to, and just advocate for the protection of him and the restoration of his human rights. Thank you so, so, so much, and we will see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.